Okay. So once again, good morning to everyone who who joined our webinar today. I'm Tomasz Zwolenski. I'm your host today to get her with my with my colleague Yurong Ma, who's a sales manager for uh, Asia and Pacific region. And I'll share his contacts at the at the end of the webinar if you're interested to contact him because he's our man in the field and the primary support for our customers in Asia. And yeah, people will be still joining the webinar during uh, during the time it's running, but that's okay. And I would just like to bring your attention to the fact that you can actually type down your questions already during the webinar, and we'll. You know, depending on what, what the question is, we'll either answer it immediately or get to it at the end of the webinar. And today we'll talk about how to increase throughput of wireless networks. And this webinar is done in collaboration with, uh, with IT Warehouse in Philippines. And, and uh, our partners have a few words for you in the beginning. So now Hi, it should be working. I'm Luis of IT Warehouse Enterprise. I'm here to welcome you today to our webinar. Now, IT cool. Warehouse Thank you for your cooperation. is based in Quezon City, Philippines, and we've been in business now for more than 10 years. And we also have online stores in Shopee and Lazada, which I will be linking down in the comments later. Now, uh, we carry a wide range of products from computer peripherals to printers and inks, routers, access points, radios, and antennas. We're a recognized distributor of various brands from Microtech to Epson. And of course, we are the first Philippine dealer, uh, I mean, distributor of RF elements. Now, what the volume is actually maxed out. Value for money. You see, a lot of uh, other products from other brands work, yes, but our elements products are not just effective, they're they just offer so much more. Is top notch stability, co location, customizability, and durability. All those words can be put into one word, which is future proof. You'll learn all about this later, but uh, I guess my point is this. As business people and as humans, we have to look as far into the future as we can. And uh, right now, there's a problem with, with noise, with spectrum, with reliability and all that. And we know that it will only get worse. Our elements helps prevent that. So enjoy the webinar. And I hope we'll learn something today. And I hope that you find the value in our elements like we do. And if you do, uh, please come join our Facebook group, RF, at RF Elements Asia. Tomas and our other friends from RF Elements are already there. You can ask questions or share pictures. And you might post exclusive uh, promos there from time to time. And that's it. Now, some words for my fellow Filipinos. Hi guys, salamat sa pag -aten. Sana safe tayo lahat and enjoy lang, syempre. And huwag kayong mahiya magtanong sa Q&A mamaya. That would be all. Again, this is Luis of IT Warehouse Enterprise. See you all. All right. Thank you, Luis, for, for this short intro. And now we can go to the topic of the webinar. So the number of people that want to be connected to the internet is simply constantly growing. And the average speed of internet connection requirement per each of these users is, is actually also steadily growing all the time. So when we add these two developments together, you actually get an exponential growth in demand for, for internet throughput and internet connectivity. So this is the kind of a challenge that WESPs are uh, facing and actually also are perfectly suited to, to solve. And the number one challenge the, the WISP networks are, are facing is that of the R of noise in the unlicensed spectra, especially, of course. And the spectrograph 
uh, or graphs like these you can see in, in the slide are, are actually very common. So high to, to very high noise, noise floor makes the five gigahertz wireless networks really slow, unpredictable, and really making the life of a WISP very difficult. And a lot of WISPs actually really gradually give up on the unlicensed spectra. And that's, that's simply because the spectrum is just cluttered and unusable. And, you know, not only actually they give up on the unlicensed spectra, but oftentimes even uh, the business as such altogether, now, since the licensed links are so much more expensive. So the entry barrier with the, with the licensed links is so, much, so big that uh, it really basically kills the whole, uh, whole idea from the beginning. And the main issue uh, here are the antenna silos, which are almost never mentioned when, when actually WISPs and people from, from this field are talking about antennas. So they talk about the high gain. Yes, you need high gain. They talk about the beam width. Okay, maybe front to back ratio, but no silos, which are the main cause of the problems with noise in unlicensed spectra. So WISPs often try to mitigate the noise problems uh, or the side lobes of antennas using various uh, shields. And if you must use a traditional shielding for an antenna and for in order for it to work properly, you, you should probably look for a different antenna altogether yeah? because shields like these uh, may improve front to back ratio a little bit, which, which is great, of course, right? Well, not really, because except the, the rare case of the exact back-to-back uh, -back facing antennas, the front to back ratio is practically useless parameter in terms of noise rejection. And the major side lobes are really not affected by the shields yeah, or shrouds. And all that the shield does is that we, it rearranges the side lobes. So they point in different direction than without the shield, naturally, but the shield does not really suppress the side lobes, as you can see from this comparison. So on the left, you have a radio, how, uh, or uh, an animation of the near field radiation pattern or the electromagnetic fields of a parabolic dish antenna without the shield. And you can see there's a bunch of side lobes pointing in all kinds of direction. And on the right, you have the same antenna, but with the shroud around its perimeter. And you can see the side lobes are still there. Okay, agreed, the front of the ratio improved a little bit, right? But the rest of the side lobes are just still there, pointing in different directions. Somewhere stronger, somewhere weaker, nevertheless, still very much present. And over the years, the radio vendors have developed their hardware very much to improve the noise situation through GPS synchronization, for example, which ensures that the access points within your network transmit and receive at the same time to prevent self interference, or active filtering, which ensures that your radio does not see out of channel signals. And these improvements are rather expensive and do not really deal with, with the root cause of the problems with interference, but rather with its consequences, which is really a wrong approach to begin with. Yeah? It's like trying to remove the smoke, for, but you know, not doing anything with the fire that caused it. So therefore, the first component on the way to increasing the throughput of wireless networks in unlicensed bands is to mitigate noise. Our solution is different. It deals directly with the source of the noise, not its symptoms. So prevention is much better than the cure. We all know and hear this old cliche here and there, but more than anywhere else here, it really makes sense and is valid. So you do not want to just suppress the symptoms, but remove the cause of the problem. And RF elements technology is the prevention. 
it provides efficient noise rejection and mitigation of um, of loss within their radio system itself through our twist port um, connector ecosystem. And this is achieved, uh, all this is achieved through our horn sector technology and the twist port ecosystem. So the horn sectors deal with the noise effectively thanks to their zero side loads radiation pattern. And the twist board is an interface that introduces practically zero loss to the signal delivery from the radio to the antenna. And the core issue um, of traditional patch array sectors are their frequencies dependent silos. And they have the silos because of the physics of the patch array antennas. They are an inherent property of the patch arrays as a type of an antenna. And the side lobes you see on this radiation pattern, uh, despite being substantially smaller than the main lobe, they still do decrease the SNR or signal to noise ratio the radio is working with, which really cripples overall network throughput. Our filaments horn antennas do not have any side lobes, only one main lobe that covers the area you need without generating or receiving any noise through the side lobes. And this effectively isolates your network from the surrounding noise, which is the essence of dealing with the noise in unlicensed with networks. Getting rid of the side lobes equals getting rid of the noise. All kinds of parabolic dish antennas used for point-to-point -point links or as a CPE antenna also have significant side lobes thanks uh, to which they cover vast areas beyond the main lobe, which again is undesired. And this, is, this also uh, makes them receive the noise from these areas through the side lobes. A result of that is the same as with the patch array sectors, poor and unstable network throughput. And again, it's just the physics of these antennas that dictate it's very difficult to avoid uh, the side lobes altogether. This is a radiation pattern of a ultra horn, a high gain and narrow beam width horn antenna. And also ultra horn has only one main lobe and nothing else. Suppress the noise and maximize throughput. So the message here is no side lobes equals no problem. But saying an antenna has or doesn't have side lobes is quite vague, right? Because it's very uh, qualitative uh, judgment. So this is where beam efficiency comes to the rescue. It is a measurable variable, physical variable that, that quantifies side lobes. In other words, it expresses the amount of side lobes an antenna has numerically. And because it's measurable, it's also reliable. So beam efficiency is a ratio of the energy contained in the main lobe to the total energy an antenna radiates. So the maximum beam efficiency you can have is 100%. And that's the ideal best scenario, in which case uh, the antenna has literally zero side lobes because 100% of the energy it radiates is contained in the main lobe. And on the contrary, the closer uh, to 0% beam efficiency is the more side lobes an antenna has, meaning uh, more problems for your networks. So here is a radiation pattern of a generic parabolic dish antenna. So its beam efficiency is 40%. This means that the 40% uh, of the power the antenna radiates goes, or signal, whatever you call it, uh, it radiates goes into the main lobe. The remaining 60% is therefore in the side lobes because everything outside the main lobe is a side lobe. Front to back ratio, for example, only quantifies one single side lobe. Yeah, beam efficiency is calculated from the full 3D data of the radiation pattern, making it uh, the most complete measure of side lobes out there. It really considers all the side lobes an antenna has. The comparison of antennas in terms of side load performance becomes extremely simple when you use beam efficiency. The higher it is, the better. That's it. 
Here on this example, you see the ultra horn radiation pattern on the left with beam efficiency of 99%. So only 1% of the power it radiates goes into the side lobes. A generic dish antenna, on the other hand, on the right side, has beam efficiency of 40%. So the remaining 60% it radiates is in the side lobes. So clearly, 99% is way more than 40%. So Ultrahorn is way better antenna in terms of noise suppression. And actually, to our knowledge, it is the best on the, on the West market in terms of noise suppression. The vast majority of antennas used in, in WISP network for sectorial coverage are either patch arrays or horns. And the patch arrays, due to all the issues we already mentioned, uh, have beam efficiency somewhere around 60%, depending on the manufacturer, design quality, and material quality, and so on. The RF elements horns, uh, both symmetrical and asymmetrical half beam efficiency between 90 and 95 percent. But you can also see other horns in this graph as well. And this is to highlight that, you know, highlight the fact that having a horn antenna does not automatically mean that its beam efficiency is high. And a stable and zero side low performance is not a given as soon as you have a horn. But we do put a lot of effort into, into optimizing our antennas, and the results are very clear. A similar thing with the point-to-point -point antennas. So the patch arrays, again, are at the bottom of the beam efficiency performance due to the many frequency-dependent side lobes collecting and transmitting noise, hurting any and every WISP network out there. Dishes are somewhat better, and generally, the bigger the dish becomes, the the better its beam efficiency as well. If the antenna is carefully designed and well manufactured as well. What is interesting here though is the ultra horn. So its beam efficiency is 99%. And let that sink in for a second because it's only 1% short of perfection. If you ever wondered if ultra horn was worth the extra cash compared to a dish antenna of equivalent gain, you have a very clear answer here. Yeah? With 99% beam efficiency, it will deliver high quality performance even in the worst noise conditions you can think of. So let's now go a little bit to uh, the other component of the, of the way to increase the throughput of wireless networks. Uh, this one talks about removing the system loss, yeah, because bringing the signal from the radio to the antenna um, can be done in various ways. And the most typical one is, you know, using pigtails. So by removing the coaxial cables and connectors, you achieve near zero loss system when delivering the signal to the antenna. And this is exactly what Twistboard does. Since the quality of coaxial cables can vary widely, you know, it, it can easily happen that you save half of the power of the signal by using a twist board ecosystem, which helps you reach those more distant customers. Here is um, a loss comparison of typical values for coaxial cable and the waveguide twist board is based on. So the red line uh, represents the coaxial cable and the black line represents the, the waveguide. So the x-axis, yeah, the horizontal one, shows the frequency and the y-axis or the vertical one uh, is showing us the loss per in decibels per 100 feet of length. So while the waveguide typically has 0.25 decibels per 100 feet, coaxial cables typically have 100 times bigger loss. So the smallest loss um, of the coaxial cable starts at, at one decibel uh, per 100 feet, which is at the frequency of 0 0.1 gigahertz, looking at this graph. When we, when we compare the waveguide and the coaxial cable at, for example, those 10 gigahertz, uh, it is obvious that there's a huge difference in loss between the coaxial and the waveguide, which 
makes waveguide practically lossless. Yeah, if it's just uh, when we're comparing very huge and a very small number, yeah, and the small number is practically zero. The equality of antenna performance uh, at both polarizations is also part of the overall throughput performance. Let's have a look how. So the traditional sector coverage is, is different when switching between polarization. And this causes problems for the customers at the edges of the sector. On top of that, because of the shape of the radiation pattern, the further away the customers are from the center of the sector, the worse their experience actually is. And horn antennas, on the other hand, um, offer a very uniform coverage in the whole sector. And the same, actually the same coverage area for both polarizations. So eventually, every customer in the sector experiences the same high quality and stable service. Now, anytime you swap uh, from a traditional sector for horn, you see the increase in throughput and you can rely on the performance it provides. Moreover, yeah, it's not only the high throughput, but also the stability of the throughput that matters a lot. So the trade-off between the antenna gain and signal to noise ratio is an important one, very important one, essential to understand, especially for those who worry about the lower gain of horns compared to traditional sector antennas. So with patch array antenna sectors there are most com that are most common in the WISP industry, you get strong side lobes with the high gain they provide. And because of the ever-present noise, the performance you can expect is diminished by the higher noise floor caused by the side lobes uh, that decrease the SNR. And this is because of the physics of these antennas. With patch array sectors, you're, you're really at the mercy of the side lobes. And no matter you know, how high the gain of the antenna, you are dependent on the surrounding noise conditions because of the side lobes these antennas have. With horns, you can easily see a huge throughput increase despite their smaller gain compared to the, to the traditional sectors you might be replacing them with. So how is that possible? As it is clear by now, the, the 5 gigahertz links suffer because of the background noise due to the side lobes of the antennas used. The traditional patch array sector has many side lobes. If an antenna has no side lobes, which is the case with our horns, it does not collect the noise, which decreases the noise floor the radio is working with. So the radio cares about the signal to noise ratio more than it does uh, just for the signal strength alone, which is why an antenna with lower gain can provide better performance. Yeah, the lack of the side lobes lowers the noise floor, resulting into higher SNR, better MCS rates, and as a result, increased network throughput and stability. Let's now look at a few use case scenarios, because what I've talked about until now uh, was describing particular features and particular um, properties of horns that do help to increase the throughput of wireless networks. So with the traditional sectors, your network throughput is very sensitive to its surroundings. So whether you're, you know, you or your competitors add new sectors, your network always sees it through the side lobes as decreased and unstable throughput. The horn antennas only cover and receive the signal from where they're supposed to and nowhere else, really. Because of that, the sector is stable and performs at the limit of, of the radio possibilities. Yeah, you can really leverage, horns really let you leverage the, the maximum throughput to that, that the radio allows you to, to push through. When increasing the number of subscribers in a sector covered by a traditional patch array antenna, you experience a decline of the throughput with every new subscription because uh, the sector is wide and the antenna has strong side lobes, the 
collocation of multiple sectors is very difficult, naturally. With horn antennas, you can divide the sectors into smaller or wider portions, and because of the lack of side lobes, each of the collocated sectors performs with zero self-interference. Superb stability and, and the throughput which results into happy customer base and a headache-free network for you as a business owner. So to sum it up, uh, dividing a wide and very sensitive sector into more compact units using horn antennas with no side lobes, you, you can collocate as many sectors as you wish, while at the same time, you can be sure that each of the sectors works at its best, leveraging the maximum throughput the radios you use allow you to do. The patcherized sectors with their light, large side lobes always see the closely located sectors resulting into you not being able to use the neighboring channels. So due to the lack of the side lobes, horns do not see the neighboring sectors, which gives you the ability and the options to fully use these previously noisy and unusable channels. Even in the case of the neighboring sectors pointing away from yours, the side lobes are strong enough to decrease the noise floor uh, the radio is working with, resulting into lower throughputs you can achieve. Now, horns can help here as well naturally. Not seeing the neighboring sectors, the noise floor is put down, the signal-to-noise ratio improves, and you can leverage those higher modulation rates up to what the radios are capable of. Now, with the traditional sectors, you don't have a lot of options in terms of the beam width of the antenna. And the side lobes make addition of every new sector really a cringing experience because the network performance will gradually decrease with every new sector added. And the superb collocation and lack of side lobes of horns makes the growth of your network easy and pain-free. You can grow the size of your network virtually indefinitely. And this is the core of the scalability and ability to grow your network throughput. Yeah, to get the noise under control with horns and adding new sectors becomes an extremely simple task. And here are a few examples of how, uh, how many horn sectors you can put up on a single tower. Looks almost unbelievable, doesn't it? With horns, this is daily reality. And once you control the amount of noise uh, your radios see, and you're working with, um, everything else falls into place. So the RF elements technology is the winning formula for unlicensed WISP networks. The lack of side lobes of horn antennas ensures superb noise immunity. The lack of coaxial cables and interconnects ensures delivery of the maximum power to the antenna. And the tool set of 11 different horns with various beam widths and gains enable incredible scalability. Yeah? You, so you can focus on the growth of your company instead of having to hassle all the time trying to fix the links that are uh, suboptimal. And all these benefits come at no added cost. You can easily do without GPS sync if the antennas do not see each other like horns do. And due to the noise suppression, you do not need to use wide channels either or spend additional extra money for non-effective fixes. Horns are a complete solution in and of itself. So that concludes the, the main topic of this webinar. And there are several very common questions we get day to day. So I'll answer them now before they're asked. And first of them is where to buy our products. So on our webpage, rfelements.com, we have a stock locator. It's on the top, uh, top menu, as you can see in the circle in the green. And the stock locator is a very nice tool. Once you're there, you select the product you're looking for, select your region, and it will give you the list of distributors nearest to you. 
Another very common question is that how far do these antennas go, right? Because obviously you need to be able to plan your network. I mean, if you have the space and time to do that, of course. And anyway, it's always do good to do your homework, right? So again, on our webpage, rfelements.com, there's a link calculator and you'll access it through the through that uh, right-hand side tab on our homepage. And it will bring you to, to the link calculator. And this is really the best tool um, to answer, to give you a really good prediction of how far our antennas can go. You can select any of our antennas, naturally, uh, set up uh, all the rest of the parameters of the link, output power, down tilt, frequency channel, height above the ground. You can place the the antennas very precisely. And uh, then of course, set also the, uh, the parameters of the CPE. And it will give you a coverage map such as this one you can see in this slide, yeah, which is actually showing you the it's the MCS coverage map, meaning that each color represents the 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 MCS rate that the link uh, is capable of working at, and that's actually really great because you immediately see what you can uh, can achieve and where. We also have the rflab.com. So besides the Facebook uh, community, besides the RF Elements Asia, which of course you were and are still invited to join, you can also join the rflab.com. And it's a user forum where many of our customers have asked a lot of questions previously about our product. So it's a really good reference because we've had it since 2000. Well, I'm not even sure from which year, but probably it's still the longest user forum we had and um, yeah it's a very very good resource for searching for answers about our products or you can ask your own of course naturally we are uh, we're here to help you we're here to support you as much as we can and uh, really the rfilab.com is the fastest uh, venue in terms of uh, the speed of the response you can get so definitely check it out on our YouTube channel, uh, we have a playlist called Wisp Traveler. And these are short five to six minute videos, which uh, where customers of ours, Wisps like yourselves, uh, share their experience with horns. So if you're not sure, if you're still not convinced, I get it. Of course, if it's something new, you, you, know, you might be skeptical. It's very natural. I would do the same. Um, and, you know, that's why I'd encourage you to check those videos and see how other other wisps have actually benefited or not from using our antennas. Another playlist we have on YouTube is called Inside Wireless. And these are short, uh, much shorter, like up to three, maybe five minute videos where we explain all kinds of concepts uh, being in the world of RF engineering. Yeah. So whether you're a seasoned wisp RF engineer, or if you're just starting, it doesn't really matter. It's a really great resource to, to use, come back to if you need to refresh something or maybe learn something new. And that concludes the webinar for today. And I'm looking forward to any following webinars you'll be attending. To. Have, a, have a nice rest of the day and bye-bye.